Uh, right, uh, colleagues, welcome to the ninth meeting in 2014 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appoints Com Committee. Uh, let me remind everybody, uh, members, witnesses and the teaming hordes in the public gallery uh, to switch off their mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. Although some members, I think I'm referring to George when I say this, will be referring to their uh, tablets for the committee papers as we are uh, moving somewhat slowly, some of us reluctantly, to the electronic world. Agenda item one is on decision and taking business in private, um, whether we'll take our consideration of a review of evidence issues for and a draft report on our inquiry into the procedures for considering legislation. Do we agree that that should be taken in private at future meetings? Yes. Agreed. Thank you. Mark Griffin. Uh, sorry, I should have welcomed Mark Griffin uh, to us today, of course, who's here as a substitute uh, for Margaret McDougall, who can't be with us today. Welcome. Um, agenda item two uh, is to take evidence from a panel. Let me welcome the members of the panel. On my left is Lynn Williams, Policy Officer, Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Michael Clancy, who's the Director of Law Reform, uh, Law Society of Scotland. And on my right, Professor Paul Kearney, Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University of Stirling. Uh, now, my approach to these evidence sessions is to go straight to questions. If at the end uh, any of the witnesses feel that there are matters we've not covered that it would be useful uh, to, to give us uh, some information on, I'll give you a little opportunity to do that at the end. Uh, so let's go straight to questions and uh, opening the batting today is Cara Hill. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, just to kick off with a general question, the legislative process in the Scottish Parliament has got three stages. In principle, do you think this model is the right one or are fundamental changes needed? Um, I mean, clearly, obviously, I'm not a legal expert and my colleagues to the left might have more to say around how that operates. I think in general, though, um, I think how the, the, the three-stage process seems to be appropriate. Um, I think to go back a bit and to make a further point is that I think generally the process and how the Parliament operates, we have to recognise that it is relatively progressive um, and that, that in many ways it is very open. So I think for me the question around how it operates is, is probably relatively well, but we have to find ways, I think, to, to strengthen that. And that there are clearly issues in reviewing the evidence so far, reviewing last week's session, and many of us agree on a number of themes, I think, around what needs to maybe perhaps improve. But let's start from the basis that we have something that does work well, and, and how do we build on that? Uh, well, um, it's a very interesting question, of course, because uh, it goes to the root of what uh, is uh, the purpose of the, the legislative scrutiny um, uh, uh, process. And, and I think that... Um, if you're looking at the, the ideas that we put into our memorandum of comments about uh, making law which is necessary, clear, coherent, effective and accessible, then uh, having a three-stage process where you uh, look firstly at the principles, um, uh, then you uh, zero in on the actual technicalities in the bill and then finally wrap up um, uh, the, uh, uh, the effect of the two preceding stages, um, that, that thematic looks as if it might be what you would expect. Um, I suppose, uh, as, as uh, Lynn has said, uh, the, the pre-legislative process uh, is something which uh, is not touched on specifically in the, this inquiry, but um, uh, it's important in setting the context for the legislative process. Uh, and if you have a sound and robust pre-legislative process, and a sound and robust legislative process, then you should end up with better legislation at the end of it. I think, um, uh, whilst I say that that, that general scheme uh, of uh, three stages is, is appropriate, um, uh, clearly there are parts of it which could uh, do with some improvement, uh, and perhaps we'll get to those uh, later in the, in the uh, session. I would say the, um, the I guess the, the rules are just as good as the people that are responsible for for using them. I think. Um, I mean, if you think, I suppose that 
if you go back to why they were introduced, one of the reasons is uh, this is supposed to be a unicameral front-loaded system. So that re requires a certain amount of give and take on both sides. You expect the Scottish Government not to bounce committees or the, the Parliament by bringing in uh, substantive amendments at stage three. And it works if they don't do that. And you expect committees not to use stage two to niggle the Scottish Government and insist on a whole bunch of changes that will affect the, the tone of the, the bill. And if that happens, then I think everyone's happy. I think it's the same with um, the reason why you have two and three in that order. The, the reason was, the idea was that committees would always go first. It would be a relatively business-like parliament. The committee itself would be business-like and, and as far as possible, non-partisan. So, you know, it would, it would be responsible for processing most of the technical legislation, and that would just leave stage three for final revisions and sort of broad debates on, on principles again. So I think those stages are good as long as everyone, you know, sticks to the deal. Can, can I just come back? You made reference to our being a unicameral jurisdiction. Um, the numbers I have, and you may be more up to date than I, is that something like 60 members of the United Nations, of the 193 there are, are, un are, are multicameral. The majority are unicameral. Are there particular challenges that we should be looking at in our process that derive from our being unicameral? Or is it simply that we, we have to have a set of behaviours that respect the fact that we're not going to be reviewed by another chamber? I, this is going back to my politics degree, which was a very long time ago. Um, I think the question for me around that would be then how the effective is external scrutiny of what's going on. Um, so if there's no second chamber to, to, to re-scrutinise, then how do we make sure that at each stage that, that the legislation is being scrutinised effectively, particularly by external bodies, uh, and also by potentially those who would be affected by the legislation? I want to go back to, to the point that Michael made around the, the good law project and the five principles of lawmaking, it would seem to me there's probably one principle that's missing, and that is what's the impact of the legislation. Um, so is there a common good or social benefit there? So for me, based on that point, then how do we make sure that at each stage of the bill, pre-legislative scrutiny, but also throughout, is that there is enough chance for, for those of us who, whose job this is, but also for those who are affected by legislation to have a say in how that legislation will be, will be shaped and how it will impact on their lives. Since the professor raised the subject, do you want to come back? And, and if necessary, correct my numbers. No, I, I can't correct your numbers. I, I was going to say my politics degree was a long time ago as well. <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, the, the usual things are there's, there's no... I think in, in, the, um, in Westminster they call it the, the ping-pong. There's, there's no chance for... Uh, there's, there's no chance to, to have a process in which you can effectively slow down or, or stop a bill from progressing if there's something wrong with it. And, and, and that's the thing that often the Lords can do simply by in, uh, suggesting some amendments. I mean, I suppose the other thing, it, I think it very much depends on which type of second chamber you've got. So, you know, often the, the House of Lords argument is that it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's staffed partly by people who have had a huge amount of experience in a previous job and who want to use that in a quite a professional or technical way to improve legislation. And they may have more experience over their careers of legislating than relatively new members of parliament might have. You know, so there are those sorts of reasons. Well, I don't have a politics degree, um, and as everybody knows, I'm not a politician. Um, but the important thing, I think, is that when you're dealing with a, a unicameral system, uh, is that, that uh, you have to set it in the context. And, of course, um, uh, the context for uh, the, uh, the establishment of the Scottish Parliament under the Scotland Act was that the voting system was supposed to be designed so that no one party would have a majority. Um, and that would lead to... Uh, there not being the capacity for a government uh, to effectively get its will all the time. Uh, and that, I think, in terms of the, the uh, founding principles of the Parliament and in terms of the uh, consultative steering group ideas, it uh, meant that the committee system was to work uh, as a robust check upon what was going to be inevitably a coalition uh, government. Uh, 
situations change. Um, uh, ideas which were once thought to be graven in stone uh, turn out to be graven in sand. Uh, and uh, so therefore you get a, a majority government which can, if it wants, get its will all the time. I think uh, that when, when one looks at the, the relationship between the House of Commons and the House of Lords, that is uh, the way in which uh, uh, the House of Commons uh, would, uh, uh, under, under any government that I've ever dealt with there, uh, has in some way or another had a majority. Um, uh, and uh, that majority means that in the House of Commons, the government can get its way. Uh, it's when it comes to the House of Lords, where there is no inherent government majority amongst peers, uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, the fun begins and that the checks and balances in that duocameral situation uh, are allowed to operate. Um, or bicameral situation are, are allowed to operate. And, and I think that that, that is the, uh, uh, the issue about um, uh, the way in which... Um, uh, structure or behaviour convener, which I think you were you were uh, leaning to, um, the, the structure of the United Kingdom Parliament uh, puts a check on government. It's not the behaviours that do that. Uh, the behaviours are that power accresses power to itself, I think. Uh, and uh, that power, uh, when it's given by an elected uh, an election uh, to a government um, is, is within the mandate uh, and a government is within its right to use its mandate. Uh, so therefore, um, uh, I think one has to temper behaviours with process and structure. Uh, otherwise, you could get into a position where um, a, a parliament is um, supine in the face of a, a, a government that decides that it will not listen. Uh, right. Now, I've got a couple of uh, members want to come in. Uh, let me just make the rather obvious comment. We're, we've travelled a little distance from the brief that we're trying to deliver. Um, relevant if we find out from that discussion what we might do here within the legally laid down unicameral structure we have. But we could have a political discussion or a discussion otherwise another time. Now, Cara, have you any other matters you wish to raise before I... Bring in your colleagues. No, no, that's Richard, I saw you first. Thank you, I'm sorry if I, I may stray for a second, but it's interesting from the SEVO's um, submission, you actually um, covered that scrutiny within the context of a majority government. And I found Mr uh, Michael Glancy's uh, comments quite interesting. Uh, I don't have a politics degree, but I am a politician. And at the end of the day, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, if the House of Lords don't want to play with the House of Commons, uh, when it goes back to the House of Commons, it, they can change it through the Parliament Act. Um, but basically, I'd like to ask Lynn Williams, voting along party lines can be seen to reduce the effectiveness of scrutiny processes. I don't think so. Why do you? a number of issues here. I think um, I want to pick up on some of the evidence that was submitted to, to yourselves. Um, and, and particularly there was, there was a submission from Children in Scotland, which is a third sector organisation, a representative organisation. And they had noted that there had been quite a lack of amendments in some areas um, at stage two and stage three. And I think it comes back to some of our experience, particularly around recent bills, where you're making what you believe is quite a strong argument for, for some amendments and you have people on side. But when you get to committee stage, these are voted down. Now, there, there are reasons for that. You know, that's how politics operates. But I think for me, I wonder sometimes if, if we maybe perhaps lose sight of this is the chance to perhaps improve a bill or to have a stronger voice for key groups in bills. And I think there is a risk to some extent that if, if we do have some voting along party lines, that happens, I understand, but do we miss the chance of improving legislation? It's a question mark, I think I would, I would raise rather than a main point. Um, and I think, it, again, going back to the public, sector, the public bodies bill, which a number of us worked on quite closely and extensively, and we're looking at, for example, recognition of key groups within the bill on top of the, the statutory partners. I mean, many of us have agreed on that with a number of politicians across parties who had agreed on that, and, and yet that was voted down at different stages. Now, to me, perhaps that bill is, is, less, is, is less strong because of that. I mean, we are now in a stage of we're consulting in a set of regulations, which perhaps might be after the fact when partnerships are already being set up. So 
the, I think it's a question I want to raise. Is, is, there, is there a risk of this happening? Is that we have less good scrutiny of legislation because of that? So, do, and, and the point that Mr Clancy made, do you believe that a, maj a majority government is a bad thing? <laughs> You know, no, sorry, Mr. Glancy. <laughs> oh, you know the, uh -huh. the, the point. You know, at the end of the day, um, yes, the system was set up that you know no party in, in, in this parliament, no party would win power, but but the, the SNP uh, party did. Um, you know, is majority government not a good thing, or, or do you believe that minority governments should uh, would uh, take on more amendments? The point that uh, Lynn Williams was putting. Uh, just before you answer that, it would be helpful if you made reference to the majority but coalition governments in sessions yeah. one and two as well. Exactly. Well, I, I, I don't necessarily, and I don't think I said that majority government was a bad thing. What I said was that when a, a government is elected, it has the mandate and it can do what it wants. Uh, uh, and so therefore that, that's not a, I'm, I'm not making a moral judgment on that, whether it's good or bad is another question. Um, it, what I was saying was that uh, it is possible then for the Parliament uh, to just do what the government wants to be done. Uh, and there is no challenge, no effective challenge, which can be made to the government unless the government is prepared to listen. Uh, but I, I, I don't think a majority of itself is necessarily a bad thing. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, I'm at the risk of getting slapped down by my convener, I just wanted to say that most unicameral parliaments have a review clause, I can't remember if it's called a sunset or a sunrise clause, after five years uh, to review the legislation. Do you think this is the right way to go about it? Do you think it's a good thing? Well, I, I, I think um, uh, in my experience, I've only had limited experience of sunset clauses. Um, and generally speaking, uh, they, they produce interesting results because, uh, let's say, for example, they allow uh, legislation to be tried and tested uh, and to, to discover if it actually works. Um, but um, uh, whether one would have them in every instance, I, I don't think that that's necessarily uh, a, a good thing. Um, uh, there are many pieces of legislation that don't need to benefit from that kind of arrangement. Right. A couple of unicameral um, parliaments have a sunset, or sunset clause automatically, but it, it's not always debated. You know, after five years, if, it, if there's no controversy, it just goes on. And I just wondered if that was the right, that's what I was really meaning. Then, uh, from, from my point of view, having a piece of legislation which um, uh, may or may not be operated, I don't think that that's, that's uh, necessarily a good thing. I would rather have specific items, specific sections which actually have a purpose and which are actually used. Right. Thank you. Can I come back to, to Richard's point? I think um, the question for me around the majority government is that I think generally you know, it has, has worked relatively well. However, I think if you look at external perception of how that operates, and I want to give you an example, and I'm going to put a personal hat on here because I'm an MP carer, as many of you know, um, and many of us supported the self-directed support legislation that went through Parliament, but there was one clause in that we were fighting about was the, the, the lack of rights for MP carers. And, and many people who I know who were activists externally, despite the amount of... We worked really hard to change that, and, and yet it went through, and, and there was a lot of support for that. So the, the, the risk to me in all of this is I think things generally work well. However, is, is be wary of external perceptions and the element of trust. So and many carers afterwards were saying, well, really, what's the point of his lobbying to try and change things? For us, we felt that there was, the argument had been lost. So because of that's, how it, that, that's the perception outside. So I think there's, there's an element of trust here we have to look at. And there is that risk. People will say, well, really, what's the point of us trying to try and change things when it's going to go a certain way? That's, that's the point I want to make around that. Fiona? Um, when Cara asked the question, she talked about um, was the model that we've got, the three-stage model, right, or are more fundamental changes needed? And I think it's interesting from what Lynn's just said, because I was here in the first parliament as an opposition member when there was a coalition government which had a majority, and I can remember the, you know, you have to work through amendments at, at committee. So is it that there is more fundamental change needed? Because we've only, in all four sessions, had one government that was not in a majority. 
This one's in the majority because they liked to put it there. The first two were in the majority because they made a coalition. So is it the case that there is more fundamental change needed or does the, the three-stage system work? I, th I think generally, I think looking at the evidence across the board that you've received, speaking to colleagues, that I think, you know, what, what, what would we put in this place, I think would be the question, is, is that generally it works. I think it's how we tweak those, those stages to make effective external scrutiny is the issue. Um, and, and that's potentially within the scope of this inquiry. Um, so the pre-legislative stages is, is absolutely critical in getting that right. And there are some really good examples of pre-legislation consult consultation. Again, give an example around carers. The, recent, the recently announced carers bill had sessions at weekends to allow carers to attend who were working. So there's examples of that. And some examples, I think, from Stuart McMillan last week around the children and young people's bill. It's how you engage people in different stages. Of the, so I think it's how do we capture the good practice that's there? If that isn't the case across different committees, then why is that the case? Um, and, and where are the where are the weaker points? I think in the different stages that, that need to be taken about. One of the points I think I don't know if it was Michael or Paul made was around um, the, the lack of a draft bill prior to stage one. And I think again, I think it was yourself, Michael, that sometimes the bills come and Parliament hasn't necessarily seen those bills before that point. You may have seen policy documents and so on as well. So how do we make sure that there are at least some idea of where, the, where a draft bill is heading? Um, stage two. Um, I think there are issues in terms of following Marshall amendments and, and, and the committee process for those of us who are external. And then at stage three, clearly there are some issues around do we separate stage three to allow proper scrutiny at stage three, given some of the recent experience you've had. So maybe we're talking slightly more major tweaks, I don't know, but there are tweaks, I think, nonetheless. But I want to get back to what I said at the beginning was, in many ways, the parliament is incredibly open. So again, for me, it's building on those strengths. Right. I could it, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, can I just uh, talk about... I'm always kind of three questions behind here, but uh, <laughs> the, um, there were a couple of things on majority and minority. Uh, I think my, my, from looking at the Scottish Parliament experience, um, there's a big difference between what, in principle, you might expect from majority and majority, uh, minority and, and what, what actually happened. And, I, and it goes back to this thing I said about... Um, about the people involved or the parties involved. So my impression of minority government was there was this very brief, maybe a few minutes, uh, sense of an opportunity for doing things very different. Uh, the committees could be more assertive, for example, because there was no majority, uh, that the, the, the governing party couldn't take plenary for granted and they could all become more business-like and independent. And I don't get the impression that ever happened. You know, that, and, and, I, th I think again. So I'm trying to be even-handed here, but you know, the, I think the government was able to operate just as, just as a, as if a, m a majority one because it had most resources. You know, it still was able to produce draft bills that, that couldn't really be changed very much by the time they came to Parliament. And some opposition parties, you know, not naming names, were not as engaged with those committees as they could have been. You know, so they didn't use those opportunities. Now I think you can contrast that with majority government where. Uh, I don't know, I was going to say backbenchers, is that a Westminster thing? Uh, MSPs, often of the same party as the majority, can have more of an influence that way through, for example, uh, meetings with their party or their ministers before, before committee meetings. I think you know, that's a double-edged thing. Often they are described as ways in which you can st stitch up votes before committees, but often I think they're also a way that people on committees can feed back concerns and can try and influence things behind the scenes. And I'm not convinced that the, the minority period was more effective for the opposition than the majority period. Uh, you know, so if you're going for that experience, it's a very difficult one to, to say. The only the other thing I would say about um, why uh, voting along party lines can uh, undermine scrutiny, which is what you're talking about, is particularly at, at the plenary stage, I think very few MSPs have any incentive to know what's in the bill because they have a list of uh, amendments and they have, I mean, maybe this isn't everyone, uh, they have a little thing telling them which button to press. And if, if you have that, the chances are, if you've not been involved until then, you're much better off you know, checking your email and then pressing the right button than, than you are getting involved and trying to amend things. In fact, it might be quite irresponsible to suggest amendments at that stage because you don't know, what the, you know what's going on with them. 
Um, yes, so I, I suppose there's a big difference between you know, the, the, the principles we're talking about and what actually is done in, in, in practice. And again, it comes down to the, the personalities involved. I should say, uh, I like to talk about Sweden occasionally. The, the, the alternative there is, uh, with a lot of um, pre-legislative scrutiny, the idea is that the opposition parties get involved at the bill at a very early stage at the same time as public and interest group consultation. Now, I think uh, in previous Scottish parliaments, that has been rejected because... Uh, many people in Parliament want this clear division between executive and, and uh, legislature so they can hold them to account. And the argument is, if the Parliament is involved in developing the legislation, then it can't step back and evaluate it at the same time. So I think that's, that's been the, kind of the thing that's held back that, that major reform. Um, I'll, I'll just exercise my convener's prerogative to say, as a minister in the minority government, uh, the committee who had oversight of my ministerial duties had seven members, only two of whom were government members, and the convener was an opposition member. It didn't always feel quite as comfortable as I thought I, I, I had. And when we took the climate change bill through at stage three, we accumulated by opposition amendments over 20 mandatory reports. So there was quite a lot went on. That, uh, so if we managed it so that it looked seamless and... Uh, and perfection. I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> Didn't always feel that way. However, that's, that's, that's rather uh, indulgent on my part. It, what I did want to pick up on, though, uh, was um, the question of sunset clauses in a particular context. Um, I think we would all recognise who are involved in the process, there are often bits of bills that are never actually commenced at all. They're passed, but they're never put into the force of law. And I just wondered if you had a view as to whether in relation to commencement there should be a sunset clause that makes everything commenced, say, after five years, ready or not. Because I think in sunset clauses that might be somewhere that there would be interest. This is something I haven't given any prior thought to. It just came out of the discussion, which... I, I wondered if you had any views on You may not have thought about this either. I haven't had any prior thought about it until just now. Um, uh, but uh, you're, I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I think it'd be a, a, probably a difficulty if, if it was to come into effect ready or not, as you put it, uh, convener, because um, uh, frequently pieces of legislation need a, a lot of support to be effective. Um, uh, and I, I, I think it would be... Uh, a, quite a, a perilous path to, to tread to have a, a sort of catch-all implementation long stop date uh, for legislation. I think we've got to, to, uh, to take things as they, they come um, and that allows um, uh, the government of the day uh, to consider whether or not this legislation ought to be brought into effect. Um, it allows uh, the government of the day, it might be the same government that passed uh, the legislation, or, or the same government that promoted the legislation, rather, uh, uh, before uh, to consider whether there have been changes in circumstances which make that uh, item redundant now, uh, or whether uh, it needs to be uh, refurbished uh, to make it more uh, amenable to circumstances at the point of implementation. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but I think uh, one would need to, to, uh, to look at it from all sides. I suppose my concern is that there would not of necessity be any parliamentary process associated with a new government of a different political flavour from that which took the legislation through, deciding not to, you know, to reject what Parliament had actually passed by simply doing nothing. But, however, let's pass on. I think we're... There is one, it's not a process, it's a principle, which is that uh, a, a Parliament cannot bind a future Parliament um, uh, and a government cannot bind a future government. Uh, so therefore, I suppose, if, uh, if the outgoing government and, uh, doesn't, decides not to implement this and leaves it to the incoming government, uh, then it is effectively ceding the decision to that government. We are, we're opening this discussion to some very wide and interesting subjects. Uh, uh, the panel says it's been a long time since... Uh, since they did their, their studies. I've just realised it's 50 years since I started my university studies, so there we are. Anyway, let's, let's move on to other things. Fiona McLeod. Um, 
In this discussion, we've got quite close to talking about pre-legislative scrutiny um, and also about stage one. It's stage one that I wanted to ask about, but in the light of your comments on pre-legislative scrutiny, you might want to talk about that as well. And one of the things that strikes me is, are there any changes need to the, needed to the rules on the supporting documents which accompany each bill on introduction? And have we got the right number of supporting documents in our rules? Because each of you, I noticed, talked about that in your submissions. Thank you. It's it's um, this this is this is this is why this is my job, and so it's my job to play through all these documents. Although when stage when the regulations for the public bodies bill dropped to my desk last week, and my heart sank a bit. You know, it's kind of like for, so for for those of us whose job it is to to wade through these documents, that's fine. Again, my question would be, what's the external perception? How do you make sense of some of those documents? Because some of them are incredibly complex. Um, some of the language used is sometimes inaccessible, um, particularly if it's a particularly technical bill, um, as the Public Bodies Bill was, was incredibly technical. So, um, I mean, I, I get the sense of looking back at some of the work you've done, that some of these documents have been in place for a long time, and that's been the process. So I think it's, it's question how that process is working. You've got the policy document, you've got the financial memorandum, all the stuff that sits around that. It's an awful lot to wade through. Um, so I think, I don't know who it was that suggested maybe some kind of way of s sucking up and making a summary document of some kind that here's this, here's the key points of the legislation, here's some other key points to consider for those of us who maybe, or for people who are external to the process so they understand what the point of the legislation is, if it's a way of making it easier and more accessible. Um, I mean, one of the things around, for example, disability access is easy read versions of these documents as well, so making sure that gen I think generally that happens, although I think with the Community Empowerment Bill, certainly one of the third sector organisations in Glasgow pointed out there wasn't an easy read version of the bill. So there's, there's things that I think maybe sometimes we don't get that quite right. Um, and I think the other point I would want to make is the, the variability in pre-legislative scrutiny as well, is that some, sometimes you have a very in-depth consultation process that involves the public, um, other times you don't, and sometimes you've got a draft bill, and sometimes you don't. So my question is, be, would be why is that that variability there? Um, you know, is there maybe a more standard process that's needed, or is that down to the type of bill and what we're looking for? But I think when you've got really substantial bills that have massive impact, you know, some of the children in Scotland, um, I've said, and um, others, is that how well does pre-legislative scrutiny work? So we have as many views as possible before the bill actually gets to bill stage. I think um, when uh, I made comment in the memorandum, I, I spoke about uh, the, the four separate documents uh, with the competence statement being attached to the, to the bill. Um, uh, the explanatory notes, uh, I think, are, are the, the area where I would focus on uh, as being fruitful for, uh, for uh, a close examination, um, because uh, Frequently, explanatory notes uh, reword the, the words of the, the section of the bill, um, uh, and I made the, uh, the suggestion in the memorandum that uh, that could be enhanced by uh, a consideration of the policy context, perhaps the uh, case law or, or a comparative analysis to make it a, a much more useful explanation of what uh, this um, uh, this uh, section actually means, uh, and that could be uh, exactly a, a bridge to the mm -hmm. to the issues that Lynn was talking about about accessibility, because it wouldn't be in non-statutory language; it would be in plain language for for people to understand. And uh, of course, all the, the various formats could be applied to it. But if one one were to make uh, uh, the explanatory notes um, more like the, the spice briefings which uh, one sees occasionally um, uh, that that I think would be a, a big help uh, the other uh, big help um, which uh, I suggest here is that um, uh, the presiding officer could give reasons for uh, considering that a bill is incompetence incompetence um, uh, because that then uh, leads one to uh, to clear out uh, issues surrounding uh, compliance with uh, EU law or ECHR or, or whatever. Um, and I think that that, that, that too uh, would uh, effectively lay the cards on the table uh, about whether or not um, uh, there were points of argument, because frequently, um, as many of you know, um, issues can turn up 
uh, during the course of uh, stage one scrutiny where uh, um, a particular view about ECHR compliance is advanced, uh, which is uh, directly contrary to that advanced by either the minister or the presiding officer uh, when uh, 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 certifying the bill. And I think that, that uh, that's a, a debate which could be avoided by uh, some transparency. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing about the, the spice briefings. If it was me, I would make sure that Parliament had the resources to produce a, a, a decent spice briefing for every bill. Because they, I mean, I, I suppose I've got the, um, the privilege of looking at a lot of these things after they've been passed. And uh, when I read the explanatory documents, you know, you, you can't read those things if you're tired. You know, you, you, you've got to get through them. But the spice briefings, well, they're, they're written from the perspective of someone who's interested as, a, as an outside observer, which, which, which most of us would be, and, and that seems very helpful. So, you know, if they were routine, that would be good. I, th I think the spice briefings are routine. I think every bill gets a spice briefing with it. Um, so it would be... So are you seeing, sort of across the piece, that the policy mem memorandum and the explanatory notes need to be less... Um, I don't want to be disrespectful, but civil servant speak and more like a spice briefing. Memorised to be librarians, so the spice briefing's obviously very good. I, mean, I, think, I think the difference is the... For, well, for me, the difference is the, the explanation of the Scottish Government is to the Scottish Parliament. I think the... The role for the Scottish Parliament is to explain it to the public. That, that's its kind of central role, isn't it? The Scottish Parliament to, to tell the public what's going on. So, it's probably a better place to do that in in one sense than uh, than the Scottish Government is, which can then focus on the you know the relatively detailed stuff that, that, that a very small audience would be interested in. I think. And sorry, uh, and, and I wouldn't wouldn't uh, necessarily disparage civil servants. Speak. I mean, it, it's it's quite quite important that uh, uh, when we're dealing with legislation which affects us all, um, uh, uh, it's precise uh, and uh, um, understandable, uh, but uh, also in its context uh, refers to the, 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 uh, the legislation appropriately. Um, what, what I think I was saying was that the, the characteristics of the spice briefing about uh, context and, and uh, comparative analysis and things like that, that's uh, what's missing in the explanatory memorandum. And just as I was thinking there, what, what are the other documents uh, which are uh, below the radar, are things like the, the um, uh, business and regulatory impact assessment, the equality assessment, um, uh, and things like that. I mean, these, these are, are also useful documents which don't get the, um, uh, the fresh air, which I think uh, many of them frequently deserve. Would it would I be right in summing up to say that the, the do current documents are necessary? There are documents that we already have that we may need to highlight more, but in terms of this committee and, and suggestions, perhaps the spice briefing becomes part of the suite of documents that must be produced, because the spice briefing is always produced, but it doesn't have to be produced. Would that be a fair summary? I think the other thing, sorry, I want to add as well is um, I think sometimes to get into the depth of, of legislation is uh, for, for really technical legislation for anybody is difficult. Um, so for me, what's important is how the consultation is, is, is ordered and how that operates and how clear that makes the process of what the intention behind the legislation is. Um, so where there is something that, you know, self-directed support legislation, whatever, there's lots where there's a lot in it, is that when you're consulting in that, whether it's pre or part of the, you know, stage two, is that that, that consultation and how, how you, for example, calls for evidence are, are worded and so on as well is really important. So that, that process has to work effectively and be transparent as well. Which nicely takes me on to my next question, which was how effective is stage one and are changes needed? But can I take you back to, we keep talking about pre-legislative um, position and um, our clerks had a look and of the bills in this uh, current parliament, 80% the government consulted on before they introduced them as a bill, and 25% they actually produced as a draft bill. So I think uh, when asking how effective is stage one, how do you feel, uh, uh, do you feel that every bill needs a draft bill, or is it, as Lynn's just said, about making sure that that pre-consultation process is structured 
so that when the committee goes into stage one, it can then structure its stage one inquiry? Proportionate. It depends. I think it depends on the legislation. Um, the, the, one of the comments that was made in the evidence, um, I'll go back to it, was the children in Scotland briefing, because I thought theirs was, was very good, was um, stage one is important, and back to that, is that, but sometimes you get a focus on particular issues, so for example it would be the Criminal Justice Bill and the focus on corroboration. So that was the example they gave us, where you'd maybe lose sight of the wider aim of the bill. So for me then, stage one becomes less about overall scrutiny, and you become focused on a particular point, and then becomes politicised. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, in terms of the figures you've, you've described, it's, it's, it's good that we've got quite a high level of consultation going on. I think the question always has to be is how effective is it? You know, is it going to change people's you know, officials' minds, ministers' minds? You know, and, and in, in most cases, I think most of that is taken on board. So you know, is it consulting with the right groups? Um, how wide is it? Do we take enough time to do that, that so that we get the bill right? Um, you know, so that you don't have masses of amendments at the other end. So for me, I think it's, it's absolutely critical. And certainly, from a third sector perspective, we are doing a lot more of that, I think. Um, and, and we are getting involved in that, and that's good because you bring a whole range of voices to that. So I think it's important we get that stage absolutely right. So you've got the strongest basis possible for developing the legislation, and then it goes through its parliamentary processes at that, at that point. We, we look at a, a large number of consultation documents uh, over the course of a year. I think last year uh, my department uh, responded to 98 consultation documents uh, um, across uh, the Scottish Parliament and the UK Parliament and quite all ministers, ministries in the Scottish Government. So um, um, it, the, there is, there is a, a sense that um, relatively well-resourced organisations can do that job uh, and uh, people who are not relatively well-resourced cannot. And, uh, and so uh, in structuring the consultation in order to structure stage one, um, uh, uh, then uh, thought would have to be given to how you, you uh, organise the consultation so that you reach uh, uh, those who are likely to be affected uh, and have a, a reasonable way of taking their views on that piece of legislation. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, uh, whether there should be a draft bill with every piece of legislation, I agree. It's a, it's a question of proportionality. Um, uh, some uh, issues are, are relatively simple and don't need um, a, a draft bill, uh, but others are much more complex and, and uh, benefit from that process. And um, uh, I recently dealt with a, a draft bill in Westminster, the draft deregulation bill, um, and gave evidence to a committee uh, in the House of Lords in, uh, late last year. Uh, so um, uh, when the bill was finally introduced, uh, the provisions which were most problematic uh, had been removed from it. So uh, uh, that meant that at its passage, or during its passage, um, uh, there was relatively little to say about the bill, and it could have a speedier passage. And that wasn't just said by me, it, was, it affected other people too. So um, uh, that, that, I think, is, is a, a, a part of the, the business of having a draft bill, is that you can learn things about the measure, and you can take the temperature of those who are going to be affected. Uh, and in that instance, it was about whether or not in a, a, repealing uh, subordinate legislation, uh, UK ministers should take uh, the consent of Scottish ministers. Uh, and I advance the argument that not only should it be Scottish ministers, but the Scottish Parliament who should give their consent to these repeals. Uh, and, um, uh, and that provision was then dropped from the bill. But uh, there was no need for uh, th that uh, UK ministers could not advance uh, repeals of subordinate legislation which affected Scotland. So that it, it's that kind of, of, uh, of issue which uh, it then makes the, the ultimate passage of the bill an easier uh, thing to deal with. And uh, at stage one, I think um, it's, it, if one is true to the founding principles of the parliament, then getting, uh, getting out into communities is a good way to do it. Uh, I, I talk in uh, our comments of, of uh, using social media but not everyone has access to social media, uh, and even those who have access to it uh, can't use it, um, uh, like me. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think we've, we've uh, 
we've got to think about uh, uh, actually talking to people on the ground who are going to be affected by these things. I suppose what you're trying to work out is should you change standing orders? And um, I think I think I would offer more of a fudge, which is um, that a lot of these things can be influenced by shifting conventions. You know, so in this case, I think what the convention might be is that the Scottish government should always provide a draft bill unless it has good reason to do otherwise. And then that shifts the expectation that it's, it's surprising if they don't provide it. Uh, they th they're thinking about why it's not possible and then they, they can justify their activity more in a way that in the current system they don't have to do. You know, in a sense, in this system just now, a draft bill is a bonus, whereas um, in, a, in a, a different convention, you know, the lack of a draft bill would be a notable loss. And you know, I think even that, without being in the standing orders, that expectation could be, could be important. One of the things that our committee, of course, can do is not standing orders but guidance. Um, I think we probably have to, ex we will probably have to think a lot more about pre-legislative scrutiny versus a draft bill, and which actually produces, as Lynn says, which produces what we need, which is engagement. Um, and I thought it was Michael's comments on the ideas on different engagement, which we are already doing in this Parliament: Facebook, Twitter accounts from committees, etc. But it is about. How do we make sure that it actually gets to the people we need? Um, thank you. That's been quite and interesting. Now, we as a committee in this session are in slight danger of doing what the Parliament's criticised. We, we haven't even got to stage two and three in our discussion yet, and we're, <laughs> and we're, we're well through our schedule. So I'm going to invite Cameron to address that deficiency. Thank you. Very, it's convenient. Um, what are your views on the amount of time allowed between stages two and three, and do you think they could be structured differently? This is between stages two and three. I think that the, the period should be harmonised uh, in terms of the same, the same amount of days. So that it's re yes. Uh -huh. I think Sorry, can I just pick up? Is that just your natural sense of order? Or are there, <laughs> which is a mathematician I, you know, some sympathy with, or, or is it founded on? a view of the processes that need to be undertaken being the same. If, uh, if you knew as much about me as I know about me, you would not say I had a natural sense of order. Um, uh, uh, it, it is partially that, but it's, it's, it, it's about uh, being able to have time to consider the amendments made at stage mm -hmm. two, uh, because, because uh, the... Uh, 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 the, there has to be a, a, a period where you can reflect on that uh, and uh, I think um, in the run-up to uh, stage in the run-up to stage two uh, you have to have time to uh, formulate the amendments that you want to promote um, uh, and uh, both of these processes are pretty similar um, uh, and uh, they require I think uh, an, an equal amount of time um, but I wouldn't be overly prescriptive, uh, and uh, if there were mechanisms to adjust the time uh, between uh, the two without going to the stage of uh, suspending standing orders, then that would be a, a, an equally efficient way to do things. Uh, I'll bring Richard in shortly. I, I did interrupt uh, Lynn Williams, who is about to contribute, so I'll let her... I, I, I wouldn't want to comment. I think I, I, on, I think the timing is an issue. There's a number of themes that struck me when looking at the evidence where at stage, at stage two and stage three is things like timing between the stages, um, how the size and complexity of bills affect those stages in terms of number of amendments, what the bills actually say, you know, what's happened beforehand and how, how effective is the bill and its, its right form and so on. Um, one thing I picked up, I think, was around the rationale for amendments. Sometimes you get these marshalled lists and you're thinking, well, what's the point of that amendment? And sometimes it's just about change of wording. The Public Bodies Bill, again, was a perfect example. A lot of it was around change. But then you go through five pages, you're thinking, right, OK, I get that. So in some cases, is there a way of explaining what the rationale for, for each group of amendments is? So if it's a change of words or a shift of you know, a paragraph, then fine. Um, and then I, I go back to the point of getting it right before you get to the legislative stage. But I think, you know, for, for many of us in the sector and across the sector is that we find that there's these concentrated bursts of time where you're 
really focused on, you know, particular stages of the bill. And again, the Children and Young People's Bill would be a perfect example. I know that came up in your session last week, is that, you know, your life stops for that period of time. And we are meant to be a family-friendly parliament. So, I mean, for me, you know, I spent a lot of time looking through, and I spoke to a number of MSPs who were looking through stuff at weekends for you as well, to have a life outside of your job too, is that you have these short bursts of energy. My question would be is how effective is that and how effective scrutiny is that for you as well as for us externally? And then I think the last point around stage two and stage three is if there's not enough time, how do you then do that temperature check outside with the, the, extent, the external view of the legislation? Have we actually got it right? So for, for many organisations, there's not that chance to take a, a breather and then look at stage two and, and what's been achieved at stage two before you move on to stage three. Um, so I think clearly there are issues with those stages from the evidence um, that we would certainly be sympathetic to, 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 to many of those views. Does Paul Kearney want to contribute before Richard? In? Yeah, a, a couple of things. I mean, I, that, that was one of the most striking points, I think, from the submissions, the, the, the effect that the timing had on the, the, the bodies expected to contribute. Um, and, it, and I think most of the tone of the submissions is that the way you work out the timing is you uh, work out at the end point and then you work out what's convenient for the Scottish Government and the Parliament according to their schedules, rather than what's convenient for the people you're supposed to be representing. So there is, a, there is an issue there. I have no idea how you solve that, but there is an issue there. Uh, the, the second one, I think I can make a contribution to this one. Um, uh, in a previous job, I looked through all of the amendments for the first session, 1992 or 3, uh, and that's, so that's, that's, I think that's 9,000, including the, the mental health bill had 900, and that's, that, that point's exactly right. I, the only way I knew, the way we divided it was there were some, most of them were very technical, they were about the, the changing words constantly throughout the bill, so you might change uh, resources to money or, or medical professionals to doctors a hundred times in a bill. Then there were the very small detailed ones, and then you know the, the, within that there were maybe you know uh, less than ten percent were substantive bills to pay attention to. Now I had no idea which were the substantive ones until I'd read the official report and 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 read the explanation given by the people proposing the the amendments. So I couldn't imagine a way in which I could know the significance of those amendments before that debate took place, which is the problem for those groups. And I think you know if if I if I couldn't do that uh, as a full-time researcher, then I can't see how anyone in, in the world <laughs> could be reasonably expected to, to know what the, the amendments mean before they're talked about. And you're talking about how difficult it was post hoc. Yeah, so I mean, I was, I think I was, it took me maybe uh, six months full-time work to go through the first session. You break that down, what's that, about 50 bills? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, what's that, six months, 108? That's, that's a few days per bill uh, just, to, uh, just to understand it, f given all the information. So I can't imagine how someone without that information, how much time it would take them to work out what's going on. Richard, and then Phil. Thank, thank you, Convener. Can I, t I turn to the submission again, the Law Society, and can I read into the record? You said that stage three is uh, an area of greatest potential for improvement should be a two-part stage three, part one involved in consideration of amendments with part two a debate with an option of further amendments to correct evident mistakes, strong case to amend the rules so splitting stage three becomes the norm. Could you expand on that and could, for the one or two new members or members who are in this session, um, we, we some of us believe that having the debate after voting on the amendments is wrong. Should we have the debate and then vote on the amendments? I think as a matter of principle, you should have the debate and then vote on the amendment, mm -hmm. yes. Um, uh, to expand on it, uh, I think um, uh, there have been a couple of instances in the past where, uh, because uh, at, at the end of stage three, that's the end of the bill, and it, and it then subsequently has passed uh, at the at decision time, <coughs> uh, there, there might have been... Um, uh, errors which uh, have crept in at stage three, which could be corrected. And, and uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, the example which I can bring to you is that, that of the, um, uh, the Alcohol Minimum Pricing Scotland Bill 2012, where, where a, a provision was, uh, was removed um, uh, at, uh, at stage three, uh, but left a, a, 
a provision, uh, sorry, the 210 Alcohol Etc. Scotland Bill 2010, uh, where a provision was removed at stage three, uh, which uh, uh, related to a section which had been deleted during the course of stage three. Uh, and so this has resulted uh, in uh, the Alcohol Minimum Pricing Scotland Act 2012 having a provision to repeal a, a section uh, because uh, it uh, makes provision for the expiry of amendments made by a section which is not contained in the Act. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, these things happen, uh, but if we had a, a, a two-stage, stage three, um, uh, then, uh, so at stage three, one, you would have uh, taken on board the amendment. Then a couple of weeks later at stage three, two, uh, you would see that uh, oh, by the way, Section 1 uh, of the Alcohol Etc. Scotland Act 2010 has this hanging section which relates to something which is no longer in the bill, you would be able to remove that and we wouldn't then have to have a section in a future Act repealing it. Uh, and I think that's a much neater, more elegant way to do it uh, and it, it means that, that uh, you don't get um, an explanatory note which says this section has no practical effect as it makes provision for the expiry of an amendment made by a section which is not contained in the Act. Um, and, uh, you know, that is an instance where an explanatory note does what it says on the tin. Um, uh, you know, uh, but we want, we want legislation to be as good as it can be uh, to be effective. And uh, the analogy is, of course, between uh, a report and third reading uh, in, in Westminster, uh, but... Uh, uh, and, I, and I know that that has its defects, but uh, it at least gives the opportunity to think again. Uh, and, uh, and that's always a good thing when making legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fiona? Just really briefly, the work that you did, Professor Kearney, on all that, did you publish it? And can you give us the reference? Oh, yeah, yeah. To the clerks later? Oh, yeah, I could do Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> My university will be very pleased with that. <laughs> Sorry, have I lost the plot for a second? Professor Kearney is going to give us the reference. Oh, I see. That's fine. Good. Sorry, I, I, I just was. I received some input from from my left there, which I, I was paying some attention to. Uh, Cameron, anything more? No, no George. Yeah, I think my question has almost been answered. But are there any changes needed to the rules and the deadlines for uh, lodging amendments during the process? Because I know with some of the bills I've worked on. Uh, it can be quite intense for us, uh, so I can understand what it would be like from your own side. So is there anything that could be changed there? I think, yeah, I think these have to be looked at. I think you know, if you're keeping the minimum period that's allowed in the, the orders, then in some cases that may be appropriate depending on the bill. I think it's might just proportionality issue, but for some of the, the, the more impactful bills where you're looking at a direct impact on people's lives in a really complex way, or, you know, um, is that, um, yeah, I think you have to look at how much time is there particularly for you to look over it all and to understand. I mean, it's, this is your job, and you, you, this is, we may be able to look at one or two bills, but your job is to look at all of them. So for all of us to have that effective scrutiny of um, the amendments and what they actually mean and what the impact will be, and going back to, I think, is, is what's the rationale for these amendments as well. So um, time scales as well as understanding what's the point of, of having these amendments in the first place. Well, if you can try to uh, construct your stage one submission uh, in such a way that it, it actually leads you to the, the amendment that you want to make. I mean, that, that would be the ideal. Uh, <coughs> it isn't always possible to do that, and to have more time rather than less is always a virtue, um, uh, without getting into a position where it becomes indolent and lazy and, and there are months stretching between. But um, uh, I, I think when, uh, when we're uh, um, looking at, as we did last year, uh, 18 bills in the Scottish Parliament, 10 bills in Westminster. Uh, we're producing a significant number of amendments across the range. Um, and, uh, and in order to compress that into the time allowed, uh, it takes quite an effort uh, of, of planning and making sure that, that uh, you've, got, uh, you've got all the material and, and uh, the right phraseology. Uh, the people that I would like to, to pay tribute to this uh, really are the, the Office of the Scottish Parliamentary Council because they do a tremendous job in doing uh, amendments for, for government uh, at, under high pressure. 
uh, and uh, the fact that, that they can do it is something which uh, I hope inspires all of the rest of us uh, who deal with amendments to do that kind of thing to their kind of standard. You don't have to. Oh, well, I just, well, I always like to talk to the academics. The, um, I suppose a couple, a couple of little things. The, 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 debate, the debate question, um, I would say you, you would decide what these debates are for. If, if, if they're for deliberation and you really think you can change people's minds, your ministers' minds, before amendments take place, have it before. Um, if it's for the public... Uh, to say either, you know, it's a great bill or, you know, it's terrible, we would have done better, have it after. Um, the, um, the, the, the other thing was um, the technical side. I mean, I suppose it might, uh, I'm going to sound like a Scottish Government civil servant, but I would say that what you want is, is two things. You want um, flexibility rather than hard and fast rules for, for every bill. And you don't want any of these changes to come at the expense of the technical quality of the bill. You know, a lot of these, th again, you know, a lot of these things could solve a problem for groups interested in the legislation and for uh, the committees considering amendments. But it could also have this unintended consequence that, you know, the people producing the bill have less time to do it. They produce a worse bill. You have more time to consider it, but you have far more work to do so. So there's a real, real balance in act there. Also, ask one of the things that, in my limited time here, that keeps coming up, and I know the Law Society put it in their submissions. There's a, there should be more use of post-legislative scrutiny. That the Law Society said there's one of the things that keeps coming up all the time, uh, and I know conveners of certain com uh, committees would say the work that they do uh, for the committees is quite intense. Quite, uh, there's quite a lot of work there as well. So, how how would we go about? make sure that there was more post-legislative scrutiny in various uh, bills that have been passed? Thank you. I, mean, I think the, the, what struck me um, in preparing for today was looking at the work you did around the inquiry, recent inquiry about post-legislative scrutiny. Um, and, and I think a lot of the recommendations that you as a committee made were very sensible. So what are the trigger points for legislation being scrutinised? Um, I mean, if we raised earlier the fact that if clauses haven't been enacted, that would question to me, well, what, why was the clause there in the first place? You know, things may have changed, obviously circumstances may have changed. Um, for particularly impactful pieces of bill, and maybe those who have been, which have been quite controversial in some ways, th that, would say, that would suggest to me there's something there that might require us to go back and look at how it's been implemented. And I think the point about that is, is how is legislation working on the ground? Um, is it having a desired effect? Um, so examples would be self direct Support Act, things like the Public Bodies Bill, the Children and Young People's Bill, where you've got that kind of focus on people's lives and how people live their lives, would seem to me to be an important trigger point around that. So I guess my question back to you would be is, how do you then take forward your recommendations from that inquiry? Because a lot of it seemed to me to be eminently sensible, is that maybe it's not required in every situation, but what are those important trigger points? for you as a parliament to be, to be clear that actually we've done our job here, this is working relatively well. I was kind of coming from a very practical perspective, uh, having previously been a councillor and been in a licensing board, the post, uh, sorry, the license in Scotland 2005 Act, you know, I would be in a committee making a decision where effectively a, a lawyer would, or a solicitor would be saying, oh, well, that's a problem with the Act, councillor, and I'm going, Right, OK, at that stage, because I'm at a different body at that stage. And it was difficult for us to say, so where, where does the Parliament get the opportunity to look at something like that post-legislative and say, how do we solve some of these issues? This is uh, an extraordinarily uh, interesting uh, avenue of discussion. Uh, and probably in the time allowed, it, 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 we can't do it justice. Yeah, just say for, for, for help for this, I'm minded to let this run for about another 15 minutes. Um, so if we can all crisp in, that'd be helpful. Um, I, I think um, when, uh, when you're looking at, at uh, uh, an issue where, where someone says, well, this, this act doesn't work, um, and the only solution is legislation, um, a, one has got to remember that, that um, when, when the Parliament is dealing with these things, it, it can only deal with uh, uh, what it has in front of it at the time. Um, and the workload of committees uh, is something which uh, the committees are not the master of. Uh, the government is the master of, of the workload of committees in many respects in terms of legislation. 
uh, clearly committees can create their own uh, um, uh, inquiries and, and uh, pursue other work. But when uh, legislation is the bulk of the work of, of some committees, and particularly the Justice Committee and its submission made that clear to, to you, um, uh, then it, one has got to think about how, how does, it, does it get to that point where a committee cannot undertake post-legislative scrutiny because of the uh, agenda which it is trying to satisfy uh, on the day-to-day -day work. Um, and that, uh, as, as Lynn has uh, reminded us, this committee has already reported on uh, post-legislative scrutiny and uh, the, the recommendations of that uh, are still to be worked through, I think, in, in the main. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's quite a difficult topic to, to grapple with when you set it against overworked committees. Uh, and how do we get to overworked committees? Well, it's because we need the expertise of those committees. So, you, so the Justice Committee develops expertise over the period of uh, some years, uh, dealing with justice issues, uh, same with, with, uh, with other committees like rural or, or environment, um, and, and uh, so on and so forth, and, and that, uh, and health. And I think that that, that is, is the, the conundrum that Parliament uh, has to, to crack because the committee is fulfilling two functions. It's, fun it's fulfilling a, a scrutiny or a accountability function, um, and it's fulfilling a legislative function. Uh, and if you were to uh, detach the legislative, um, uh, then you might be able to create more time for uh, post-legislative scrutiny, uh, but you might lose on accountability, and you end up with a, a split kind of committee system, which this parliament uh, had set its face against from the very beginning. Um, so so uh, we, are, we are going to confront this problem again and again of legislation which, uh, in practice, uh, we discover doesn't work. Um, it might come up uh, in an instance where, where someone has scrutinised it because it's going to be adjudicated on in some way, either at a court or a licensing tribunal or, or a licensing committee or whatever, um, uh, or it might uh, come up because of a more structured review of a, an act of, of Parliament. Um, I favour a more structured review. That's my natural inclinations once more, convener. But uh, I, I freely accept that you, you can't uh, do that for everything. Uh, and there will be instances where uh, someone uh, recognises for the first time, maybe some years after legislation has been uh, brought into effect, that this piece just doesn't work and it needs to be fixed. And that's why we have emergency legislation. Paul. Uh, I was just trying to remember uh, what, what I said when we gave evidence on post-legislative scrutiny. <laughs> I don't want to contradict myself. But the, uh, you know, well, I mean, I suppose you could just say it's all good, uh, flexible debate. Uh, but, but, I mean, I suppose there, there are a couple of things. That, one thing about this system is with the, uh, and that goes back to stages one, two, three, often what happens at stage three is the MSPs will raise issues and the minister will say, well, we'll, we'll deal with that in regulations. And they make promises, and it's probably a good idea to regularly check if they've kept them. You know, so that, you know, there's one, one reason for, for post-ledge scrutiny. I think what I said before is, if, if you want meaningful post legislative scrutiny, you have to build it into the legislative process in that the evaluation of any, uh, either the success of any bill is always going to be party political just as much as the introduction of it. So what I think you would want from the Scottish Government is for them to say what their aims are clearly and for them to state how they should be evaluated so that that structures then that, that scrutiny. So that it, I mean, the, the, the alternative is you have an inquiry process which can be much more open-ended, but it doesn't give you that chance to say, well, this is a this is a structured or a relatively objective evaluation. I think, you know, if you, if you wanted that more technical evidence-based sense that something had failed or succeeded, you would have to know what they had set out to do in the first place in a clear sense and for those, to, those measures to be entrenched in the legislation or the guidance. Uh, let's just move on to the, the, uh, a few final items. Uh, in particular, uh, is it easy for parliamentarians and for people outside to understand with the documents that we provide what's going on at stage two and stage three? 
and in particular, picking up on what came out before, given there are no mandated documents of explanation required for amendments, although there is for the bill, should we do something about that? If there is there's an issue there, convenient, absolutely. I think um, I was going to say in Kenny Dalglish style, maybe I, maybe no. I think in some cases there probably are. The, 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 a bill is relatively clear, the documents are clear, but I think clearly from, from the third sector's experience laterally, there's a speed around bills which concerns us to some extent as we're not taking that breathing space to think about things and I understand the drive to put some bills through and that's fine. But sometimes that might actually be, be counterproductive. So I think clearly when the evidence is saying to us there are issues here at stage two and stage three, that there's complexity here that people can't wade through. Again, for those of us who's a job, if we're finding it difficult, then how much more difficult is it for those who are watching with interest in particular pieces of bill? I'll go back to self-direct support legislation, which was being carefully watched by carers across, across Scotland um, and behind the scenes trying to make sense of what it meant for them. Is it, if it's difficult for us, how much more difficult is it for those who, who want this legislation to go through and to change their lives? So, to me, that's always got to be the litmus test, is how clear is it? Well, so, do forgive me. I'm hearing the problem described. It, it would be helpful if there are any ideas. We may have to come up with them uh, as to how we might actually solve that problem. Michael. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, well, when... when, uh, when the Law Society sends out amendments to, con to committee members. Um, it uh, provides uh, an explanation uh, and uh, an effect uh, to each of, of the amendments which it promotes. Um, uh, and that is designed uh, to, to help the, the uh, member uh, understand where, where we're coming from, what the, the impact is on the, the section, and if there's any corollary uh, impact uh, on other parts of the bill. Um, and I, we know, uh, because it, it happens, um, uh, that when ministers are presenting their amendments, uh, they, are, uh, they are speaking to notes which have been written for them, which do exactly the same job as uh, uh, our, uh, our uh, rationales. Uh, so, therefore, the material exists. Um, uh, the only uh, problem about making that material uh, public uh, along with the amendment um, is that it would deprive ministers of uh, actually saying something during the course of uh, the conduct of the debate. Um, we don't want to do that because ministers have to justify uh, what they're doing. Uh, it's, uh, it, you may give a reason, you may give an effect, but it's the question is justifying it. Uh, I, I mean, and I think there are these, these are different things. Uh, but uh, I, I would certainly be in favour of there, there being a, a short explanatory note um, uh, with each amendment, uh, which would guide one to uh, the, the rationale for that amendment. So, in essence, you are suggesting that there might be utility if the explanation is not provided at the point where the decision is being made, but sufficiently far in advance to allow some wider consideration by opposition members, by government backbenchers, so that the quality would be improved. And after all, stopping the minister speaking is not necessarily a bad thing. And I, I, I did a post scrutiny on myself on the climate change bill, and I actually spoke for over four hours at stage three, which you know I could have probably managed with less. I, I think if, if the, the rationale is given well enough in advance, it allows people to contemplate what the amendment is actually designed to do. Uh, it would assist in making an amendment to the amendment. Um, uh, and it would also uh, mean that uh, uh, stage three appearances might be less gruelling for ministers and for the rest of us. I think in land reform, we, yeah, I think it was land reform, we certainly had amendments to amendments to amendments. But however, that's not occurred again as far as I'm aware. I would say I'd be supportive of that. I think if there's a way of explaining the rationale behind that and if the work has been done already by officials then as a way of obviously crystallising it in some way that you've got a clear explanation for each that that would be that would make sense. Okay. That's helpful. Paul, you got anything to say on this? Yeah I'd say that I mean I think the the, the role of the Scottish Government there would be to explain it to the Scottish Parliament and then the, the Scottish Parliament could decide if that explanation was adequate, or if I had to do, if I could explain it more to the public in a different way. I, mean, I suppose the only, the only, I mean, my sense when I go back to that research I was talking about in reading those things was that uh, the, we, we, the way most ministers explained amendments was pretty much as written down. You know, reading from 
something prepared for them, by and large. So if it's already written down, then you would imagine it wouldn't be too hard to just uh, you know, give people the, the script before they read it. I suppose the only issue that would be, it would be difficult for ministers to ad-lib because you wouldn't want a written record that's different from the spoken record. I mean, I, I don't know, for legal reasons, isn't that sometimes what they say in Parliament is taken as the justification for the bill, so you might not want them to divert too much from the script. But, I mean, I think that's a kind of fiddly issue compared to the, you know, the, the, the benefits. Uh, yeah, I, I have seen um, over the shoulder of one minister, uh, Minister, do not depart from your brief written in, in red ink at the top of it. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, you're right, Paul. I mean, for Pepper v. Hart purposes, if, if, uh, if a minister is giving uh, an explanatory statement of a provision in a bill which uh, might be ambiguous in terms of its interpretation, it's important uh, for us to have a, a, a clear explanation of that ambiguity or, or the interpretation of ministers so that it can later be used for Pepper v. Hart purposes in, in court. Um, Mark Griffiths. Uh, Griffin, sorry. I'm Thank you. I do uh, apologise. I, mean, I think this question has been, been answered partially in, around a, a statement of reasons attached to an amendment, but just to speak more broadly um, about the legislative process, just to ask whether you feel that that is open and, and transparent enough and if it, it properly encourages engagement um, with outside bodies right throughout, throughout the, the stages of as, as the bill makes its way through Parliament? I think, I think generally that there, there's a real openness there, uh, Mark. I think there, you know, there's lots of ways that people can engage with MSPs as ministers. Um, you know, I, I think in that sense, the beauty of the Scottish Parliament is, is incredibly open. You, know, you can meet with ministers regularly, you can meet the MSPs, have a discussion, you can cross party groups. There's a whole lot of ways that the, the Parliament is open. I think that, again, back to what I said earlier, there, there are ways to improve that openness and transparency but without losing what we have already. And I think that's the uniqueness of the Scottish Parliament is, is, um, is beauty and, uh, and, and go back to its founding principles. So, yeah, let's, let's build on what's there and let's try and find ways to make it as transparent as we possibly can. And I think, to be honest, some of the suggestions we've had today would, would definitely help there. Well, I, I would like to think that uh, the Parliament is uh, very open and transparent, um, but uh, it... Uh, it's always good to be able to try to improve that and some of the suggestions and some of the discussion which we've had today uh, go some way to, to advance uh, that openness and transparency, I would like to think. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know, typical social scientist now, but uh, I think it's probably more open than transparent. I mean, it, because, you know, the, the idea of openness is that you pretty much you tell everyone what you're doing, which the Scottish Parliament does remarkably well. Um, but... There's a difference between that and people understanding what that means. Uh, so I'll give you the. the I mean, it's, it's not just it's not just you. I mean, I do. I put out almost everything I write in my blog, but I know that the chances are that no one's going to understand half of it. You know, that, that, so I'm being open, but you know, I'm, I'm not giving people the language to make it transparent. There's a real difference there. Okay. Cameron, do you want to just wrap up? Yes. Quickly. Oh, thank you very much indeed. The secondary committees, and I noticed that Michael Clancy says the secondary committees, how effective they are. You think that perhaps having members of these committees attend the lead committee consideration at stage one and two for a secondary uh, involvement of secondary committees. I just wondered if you think that is possible. What do you think? The, the, how do you think the, you know, the involvement of secondary committees, is it in the legislation process? Is it useful? Is it essential? Oh, I think it's you put in your submission that. Well, I, I do think it's essential because uh, the, the focus of, let's say, delegated uh, law reform and delegated legislation uh, is on uh, those uh, elements in uh, bills where uh, subordinate legislation is going to be used. So, um, it, yes, I think it is uh, uh, something which would be useful where uh, a member of that committee to be present um, uh, during the discussion of those provisions in a bill where where delegated uh, legislation powers were, were going to be uh, created, um, uh, that would then enable that member to inform more proximately than simply reading the, the uh, official report uh, of the discussion, the flavour, the, 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 the mood of the committee uh, as the lead committee when, when they uh, report to the Law Reform and Delegated uh, Powers Committee. So. Anybody else on that? The, the, 
No, OK. Anything Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, right. Um, I said I'd provide the opportunity to panel members to make any concluding remarks that they, they, they wish to make to us briefly. It's not compulsory. Um, Lynn? Yeah, just to say, I think, um, thank you for your time. I think it's been a, a fantastic debate, and I think um, it, this is, in some ways, that this inquiry is incredibly timely at a time um, when we are beginning to look at ourselves as a country generally, but also just to take stock of where we are. And, and given where we are in terms of things like electoral turnout, is that how do we rebuild trust? And that the transparency point that Paul made is that you know getting this right is incredibly important for the perceptions of the Scottish Parliament, how it operates, and, it's, and people's trust in it as well. So um, you know, I'm really pleased to have the chance to, to contribute today. And I think it's important always to keep the focus on why we're doing what we're doing and, and what's the outcome at the end of it. Um, thanks, convener. Uh, the uh, uh, the one thing which has not been mentioned uh, during our discussions today is the referendum. Uh, and the impact of the referendum, whether uh, uh, the, uh, the vote is for yes or for no, uh, and the impact of, of that on the Parliament in terms of either um, a vastly increased range of powers um, uh, or uh, some increase in range of powers dependent on the outcome. Um, uh, and uh, so therefore I think uh, at some point in the future there's a, a discussion to be had about uh, the legislative capacity uh, of the Parliament uh, for dealing with a range of new powers um, in, in, in subjects which uh, hitherto have not necessarily been uh, within the province and uh, thinking of the Finance uh, uh, Committee dealing with, with um, uh, the, the new taxes and things like that. I think, I think we've got to be looking to think about um, uh, the, the legislative capacity of the Parliament. Uh, your uh, capacity for provocation never surprises me. Paul? Well, I'll, I'll just give you my, my stock answer. The, um, I, my view is that the, the MSPs don't have the resources they require given the demands on the time, and, and, and scrutiny is always going to be limited because of that. Um, I think the big solution to uh, these problems that that we discuss in this committee is to vote yourselves more of the budget before you give it to the Scottish Government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's an absolutely first-class note upon which to, to end this evidence session um, without my making any observations as to whether I support or disagree with that. Um, can I thank you very much indeed for your generosity and both the time you've taken to prepare, which showed through in the evidence you've given and the contribution you've made in attending and informing our uh, deliberations. Thank you very much indeed. Right, we'll suspend while you move on, although we will we'll start almost at once. We absolutely must finish by half past, and I suspect the agenda is a bit challenging in that regard. Right, the next two items are in public. I just remind you of that. Uh, first of which is on uh, cross-party groups, and uh, we're here to consider uh, some of the, the the report draft report we have, and looks at some of the positive work undertaken by groups. Um, it also demonstrates the new monitoring system for cross-party groups is proving effective. The vast majority 
of the groups now routinely providing more detailed information on their activities and finances. Paper details where groups have undertaken work or require them, such as holding AGMs, out with the timescales set in the code. In addition, it highlights two groups that are not currently compliant with the rules on ensuring the group is sufficiently uh, cross-party in nature. Um, do members wish to comment? Richard. Uh, I, I think it's an excellent report, uh, convener, and, and I compliment uh, uh, the officials on it, and it gives a flavour of, of what there are some like 88 cross-party groups. Uh, um, Abras to start an hour two, so we might get to 90 or even 100 but before the end of the session. But basically, the, the situation, there, are, there is problems, and I think the, the fundamental problem is trying to sometimes get a room and, and contain, I'm not going to mention the group, but contain with one of the, one of the, the, the submissions in here. Was, I, I was outside the door waiting on a committee meeting, finishing for the group to come in and... and uh, committee overran substantially, which meant that the AGM couldn't be held and had to be put back about a couple of months. So therefore, that group then ran into difficulty because their AGM ran out outside. And I'm not going to name uh, who they are, which I think would be very unfair. Uh, just to finish off, I think writing to conveners of, the, of groups requiring an, an explanation of why things aren't happening correctly is the, the way to go before we, uh, as I would suggest, stick the boot in. Um, I think we've got to basically uh, ask them to comply with the rules and regulations, and if they don't, then that's brought back to the committee and, and, and we make the recommendations. But I, I thank you for the report, and I only flag up one thing, that sometimes it is very hard for a group to get a room. Uh, can I just respond? I don't think it is our role to ask anyone to comply with the rules of the Parliament. That is a given. It's certainly our rule... Uh, our role to ensure that uh, any apparent failure to comply with the rules is drawn to the attention of people and for us to act if there is a continuing failure. I think that's certainly true. But, but I, it, it really, the system will work if there is self-discipline and we rely on that in many other things. Fiona. Um, Excellent report, thank you very much. And I think when we turn to paragraph 20 about the different things we can do, um, writing to conveners of groups, I think they've, the clerks have done that as we've gone along, so we've got the explanations for most of them and almost everyone is understandable. Um, can I particularly pick up on the cross-party groups on Russia and Scots language? Um, to say to the committee members I'm doing that because I've been here before and we've had problems with Russia and Scots language cross-party groups. So I would like at this point, given the work that we've done for those two groups, is at this point to suggest that we actually ask the conveners of those groups to come and give us an explanation of why they're still failing to meet the requirements. And what remedy is the plan, perhaps? Yes. Would that be fair? Yes. Cameron. Is there something that, uh, I see disband. Is there something we could suspend groups? But, for instance, Poland, for example, might be because there aren't enough people who are interested in Poland in this session from the last session. We can't. They either exist or they don't. Right, OK. There is no middle okay. ground. Right, OK. I mean, one might argue there should be, but yeah, there can't is put no it in middle ground. No. OK. Procedurally. Thank you. Right. Yeah. There's nothing to stop a group returning. No, no, I see that. In the notes, you can, where they can come back again. It's just that it might, I thought it might be. It, because something like Poland, perhaps, is because there aren't enough people who are interested. In, in the last session, there are people particularly interested in Poland or Russia or whatever it was. I don't know. And maybe there isn't in this session. So, or they can't, you know, or the convener's um, it, gone it, it, or, or it is, departed. It is, it is perhaps just worth reminding colleagues that uh, the cross-party groups end at the end of a session. They need to be in action for them to open again. So... They don't continue across the end of a session. Ah, okay, thank uh, you. So I just made that point for clarity. However, now Fiona has made a proposal to us, which I think we should consider before we move on, perhaps to wider debate, uh, that we request and require, perhaps, uh, the convener of the conveners of the Russia and Scots language groups to appear before us. Uh, is that something that uh, members are minded to agree to? Yep, we're all agreed on that. Right, thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, right, anything else anyone wishes to say on the r report?
Good. That's all. Okay, grand. Right, agenda item four is our annual report. Um, uh, we have a draft in front of us. Um, we have to produce a report under the parliamentary rules, understanding order rule 12.9. Uh, do colleagues have any comments they wish to make or amendments they wish to suggest? Richard. Again, uh, uh, Kadina, I, I believe an excellent report shows how hard the committee has been working under the previous convener and yourself as the new convener. And uh, I compliment the officials on it. Fiona? I recommend it to the committee. Fiona. Um, I've written a note at paragraph three, but I might be wrong because of the time scales. Um, procedures for considering legislation. Should we add in about the public engagement plans that we're about to go, or does that fall out with this annual report? Thank you. Um, just, this is up to 10th May 2014. So, next year. Right, uh, so are we agreeing the report? Do we agree? Yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, and uh, since we're not making any amendments, you're content for the convener to sign off. Yeah, that's grand. Uh, that concludes the public uh, part of the uh, committee, and I now move this committee into private session.